<laughs> hello, hello. I know Alex is, Alex is one of my favorite people, and every time I hear one of his talks, it just really, really makes me question uh, how I deal with my own security. So I'm, I, I understand why all of you are, are chit-chatting right now. Um, and the other great thing about Alex is that he wants to talk to all of you. So during the breaks, find him. He will have incredible conversations with you. So um, hello, my name is Bodana Kasala. I'm the managing director of all the international summits that happen all over the world. And before I start my talk, I do want to tell you all that I was actually born here in Pamplona, Spain. Yes. <laughs> so I feel I have a thank you. I had so much to do with it, too, you know. <laughs> but uh, I feel a real connection to this country because of that. It was um, a bunch of circumstances that brought me to, into this world in Pamplona. But bottom line was that my father went to medical school um, in uh, uh, Universidad de Nevada. And, but they did not, my parents did not think to teach me Spanish. So every time I go through customs here, on the US passport, it tells you where you're born, and the customs agents always refuse to speak to me in English, because they're like, no, 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 you should know Spanish. <laughs> so, but um, how and why I ended up here in Spain is, a, is another whole talk, but I am very honored to be here talking to all of you today. So I'm going to start, I started my journey here, born in Pamplona, Spain, and I'm going to forward to 2004. And in 2004, I graduated with my master's in fine arts in painting and started working as a professional painter, um, exhibiting my work all over the world. This is from a new series that I'm actually working on right now. And, uh, and I was doing, and I was, I was doing my passion. I was thought that being an artist and painter and working around the world and exhibiting my work, and I actually taught at the college level at the San Francisco Art Institute, um, this was what I was meant to do. And I was successful. And being successful as an artist means you can pay your bills. That's, that's pretty much what it means to be successful. But you know what? I was happy and I was doing something that I truly, truly love to do. But in 2011, I had my own disruption in my life, and I had to find a job uh, that paid a lot more, that just didn't pay the bill, so that I could support myself and my three children. And so I went out into my community, and I asked my friends, if you hear of anything that you think would fit me or suit me, please let me know. And a friend of mine sent me this email that she saw on a post, on a blog. She just sent it to me, and it said, nonprofit based in San Francisco, looking for an event planner, please apply. And there was just a name and a Gmail address. So it's not even like I could figure out who this company was, what this nonprofit was. And I was like, all, all right, well, you know, I can put events on, why not? And I <laughs> sent my resume. About a few hours later, I get a phone call from a woman named Julia. And she says, hi, I'm Julia. May I speak to Bodan? I'm like, that's me. And she said, you know, I just got your resume. We see that you sent it to the nonprofit. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions before I tell you about the position? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And she said, do you, do you know um, what PayPal is? I was like, no, I, I've never heard of PayPal before. And, I, and she's like, OK, OK, that's fine. She's like, have you ever heard of Facebook? I was like, no, I've, no, sorry, never heard of Facebook. Now, you have to understand, this is the technology that I used, OK? <laughs> this, is what, this is what I use daily, and I still think it's better than all of this AV, because it always works. <laughs> but this is what I use. So I had no idea what PayPal was or Facebook. And then she asked me, well, do you know, sorry, do you know um, who Peter Thiel is? And I said, no, sorry, I don't know. Now, mind you, I'm living in San Francisco. I've been living there for almost uh, 10 years at this point. I really probably should, should have known who he was, but I had no idea. It's not the world I lived in. And for those of you who probably everyone here knows, but Peter Thiel was the founder of PayPal, first investor of Facebook, big unicorn in Silicon Valley. He's pretty much invested in every other unicorn in Silicon Valley before they were unicorns. 
And he decided to start a nonprofit, and part of that nonprofit was the Teal Fellowship. And so he was looking for a group of people to run this fellowship, and that's what the job was. And so after this, she tells me all about him and what he does and what he wants to do with this fellowship. Um, she's like, well, do you want to come in for an interview? And I'm like, what the hell? What, why would they want to interview me? I knew nothing about this, but I was like, yeah, sure, I need a job. I went in the next day for an interview. Peter walks in, shook his hand, talked to a few people. When can you start? I was like, okay, well, what's the job? <laughs> That's what I need to know. What is the job? The job is to be creative. That was the job. That was my job title, be creative. And what Peter was doing with this specific fellowship was, it was also called 20 Under 20. And this was giving a fellowship of $100,000 to 20 young people under 20 years old um, for two years. And there was only one caveat to this fellowship, and that was you could not go to college while you took on this fellowship. And that was because Peter wanted to start the conversation of the one-size-fits-all path. Is college actually the path for everyone? Is that the path to success? Are these amazing young entrepreneurs being weighted down by the debt that college causes in the United States, which currently uh, is 1.3 trillion US dollars that American students are carrying in debt? And so for me, I thought, OK, this is a very interesting spin on what, where I came from, being that I've gone to college, I've gotten my graduate degree, I've been teaching at the university level, um, but to think about, well, yes, that's the path I took, but is that the path for everyone? And so the other reason I wanted to bring up this story was because this job description of being creative, you know, that is what he was looking for in building the team that, put, that ran this fellowship and that designed the programming around this. He's a big picture guy. You know, he told us, this is what I want, and we did it. And my question to all of you is, who do you surround yourself with? Is it all people that you hire, people around you with the same degrees, the same background, the same kind of home life, you know, think about who you surround yourself with and how that can change your perspective. While I was working at the Teal Fellowship, Peter was writing his book, Zero to One, which I highly, highly recommend. And it was great to be in the office there because we got to see the previews of the book and got to read them and have a lot of very interesting conversations in the office. And the great quote that I love is, from the book is this, and it says, doing what we already know how to do takes the world from one to n, adding more of something familiar. But every time we create something new, we go from zero to one. The act of creation is singular, as is the moment of creation, and the result is something fresh and strange. Fresh and strange. Obviously, the word creation, for me, being an artist, really hit home in that one quote, and also fresh and strange. And now being at Singularity University for almost three years, um, I see how we discuss innovation and disruption, um, and it's usually the examples we use is Kodak or Nokia, and how that's uh, um, disrupted different industries. But how I want to talk about it is in a totally different way, and that is through art history, because disruption has been happening for a very, very, very long time. And I feel that maybe you all will see it in a slightly different way if we talk about it through art history. So for this to work, we're going to take a little art quiz. It's going to be fun, I promise you. But it's not going to work unless you all participate. So. Uh, Try to participate, I, I encourage you. The uh, first question is, does anybody know who painted this? No. All right. Does anyone know who painted this? Uh, 
The first artist is Solomon J. Solomon. The second artist is Bouguereau. These two men were the most famous painters in Western art during the 1800s. Absolutely the most famous painters, okay? They made the money, they had the context, they went to the parties, they got all the women and probably all the men, okay? It was, they were like the Beyonce of the art world. <laughs> Solomon actually won the, what we would call like the Nobel Peace Prize for art. That is how famous they were. Let's go on to uh, the second part of the quiz. Who's this? Exactly. Vincent van Gogh. Next, who's this? Monet. Exactly, water lilies. These two men painted at exactly the same time as Solomon and Bouguereau. They were around exactly the same time. These paintings were considered shit, okay? This was awful. This was not art. This was child's play. Why would anyone consider this art? What were these men doing? This was terrible. And I know that we're used to now seeing these images on coffee mugs and posters, but think about it back then when this showed up and they were like, <sighs> and to me, this is the perfect example of fresh and strange. I love this quote, and this is my favorite painting by Van Gogh. Instead of trying to reproduce exactly what I see before me, I make more arbitrary use of color to express myself more forcefully. To me, this is an artist's way of saying zero to one. Now, I don't want to diminish what these two men did, because this is still pretty freaking awesome. Solomon painted this painting when he was 26 years old. Can you imagine doing something like this at 26 years old? That's, that's incredibly impressive. But if we look, use art history as an example, we can actually see who Solomon was looking at. He was looking at Van Dyck, saying, okay, I see that, and I'm gonna make it better. One to N. And who's Van Dyck looking at? He's looking at Rubens and saying, yeah, I see that. I'm gonna try to make it better. And who's Rubens looking at? He's looking at Michelangelo and saying, I see that, I'm gonna make it better. And who's Michelangelo looking at but his teacher? Now, I could not find a painting by, and I always say his name, or Ghirlandaio, um, doing a Samson and Delilah. But I do like this example because he was one of the first painters to really focus on perspective. And perspective is where you have a middle ground, a foreground, and a background. And when you go all the way back to Solomon, you see that he really did master that in this figure. So you see that one to N through art history. Now, going to Bouguereau, I do, th this painting actually caused a lot, a lot of ruckus because it was one of, the, one of the first paintings to have a nude of a woman for no other reason but that she's nude. This is a, to, it was very voyeuristic, caused a lot of waves. That's my joke for the day. And, uh, and so, you know, there was usually reasons for a woman to be nude. She was either a goddess, or she was nursing, or in some struggle where her shirt came off. But there was no reason for just, you know, your next door neighbor to be nude. However, the Spaniards beat the French. Goya, right? He did it first. <laughs> he did it first. But once again, we see who was Bouguereau, uh, uh, sorry, who was, um, uh, yes, <laughs> looking at, thank you. So going back to the first example and all of you really not knowing who Bouguereau and Solomon were, think about this is the type of artwork that you would see. You'd, this is what you'd see in churches. This is what you'd see in people's homes, these types of work. And then bam, you see this, fresh and strange, absolutely new, creative, fresh and strange, zero to one. So take that in when you see 
when you're looking at out into the world and you see something, and I'm not just saying the art world, but anything, where you look at it and go, uh, really? I don't know. Uh, that's, that's weird. That's a little strange. And instead of having a negative reaction, try to turn that into a positive and look at it a little differently than just what you inherently may, re how you inherently may react to it. Now, going back to me, because you know that's why I'm here. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so, as I said, I was the, uh, I am the managing director of the international summits, and I get to work with the partners all over the world to put on these summits. And as you can see, you'll see some of our speakers here and our partners. Um, and actually, we are having our summit partner meeting after the summit. So most of the partners around the world are actually here. And I encourage you to uh, find them and talk to them because they are absolutely amazing people. But what I have found in this global community of partners is that they, are, they hold the fresh and strange. That is how they see the world. That is how they see educating people about exponential technologies. But not only that, but inspiring people to think differently. We had 14 international summits last year. And this year, Spain is kicking off our year um, of over, we're going to have over 20 summits around the world. I'm incredibly proud to manage and facilitate all of these absolutely amazing people and what they want to do and share with you our reach around the world. Our global community, we have alumni of over 21,000 people representing 110 countries. And now all of you are alumni of SU. You are all part of this number. We're going to have to change the slide because of it. And so congratulations for being part of this. This is, this is an incredible opportunity for all of you to talk to each other, to find your tribe, to find the fresh and strange, to think about creativity. Think about the creative. I usually end my talk with a story uh, from when I spent some time in Africa. But being here in Spain, for some reason, I felt like kind of going back to my roots and even before that. So I want to finish up by telling you a story about impact and hope. So my mother, both my parents, but this is a story about my mother, um, emigrated to the United States from Ukraine during World War II as a child. She was five years old. But before she emigrated to the United States, she was put in a displaced persons camp. And so the displaced persons camps were around Europe, run by the Allies after World War II. And this was, these were camps, what we would call today refugee camps. But back then, after World War II, they were called displaced persons camps and dips for short. A lot of, it ended up being, dips ended up being a very derogatory term in the United States for these immigrants who came. But these camps were way stations for people who had no country to call their own. And so this were, there were close to a million people who went through these camps. And these were not only for the liberated Jews from the concentration camps, but also for many, many Eastern Europeans who had nowhere to go because they had no country left. There was no Ukraine. There was no Czech. There was no Slovakia. And my mother was one of, one of those people, uh, uh, she and uh, my grandparents. This slide is interesting. This is how they kept track of everyone, just on a chalkboard. How many how many Poles there were, and how many um, Romanians there were, how many Russians there were in the camp. And so as a family in Eastern Europe, you crossed your fingers and you hoped that you got into a dip camp that was run by the Americans, because they had the best supplies, the best food, the best tents, they had blankets, all of that. Many of the other allies didn't have enough for their own people, so they didn't have much for their, for their camps either. And luckily enough, my mom was, and, her, and my grandparents were at an American dip camp. And 
They waited there to get their papers, to be able to move forward, to see where they'd end up in the world. And they ended up actually in the United States. And as a child, uh, my mother would get these tins once a month. And in these tins, all the children in the camps got one. And in these tins would be a toothbrush, a bar of soap, just maybe a washcloth, just kind of things that you didn't have access to, and a very small toy, a, a toy soldier, a marble, a rubber ball, something like that. And this is what she looked forward to every month. It was like Christmas. It was just absolutely the most important day of the month was getting one of these tins. So luckily enough, my mother's family got sponsored to come to the United States and they moved to New York City. And she's five years old, she comes to New York City. A week later, my grandmother walks her over to the nearest public school, drops her off, and she goes <laughs> into first grade, and there she is. Not really, not speaking any English, but my grandmother, you know, she's like, she'll figure it out. It's a very immigrant mentality, but she'll figure it out. And that day, they called everyone into the gymnasium. And so my mom, you know, just followed the crowd, went into the gymnasium, and she saw tables and tables and tables of these tins. And the kids were putting the soap and the toothbrush and the toy in these tins to send to the dip camps in Europe. And there she was, face seeing what she was receiving just a few weeks earlier. From that point on, every month when these tins were being put together by the school children, she would write a letter in Ukrainian to the next child who would get this tin and this toy. And what was she giving them? She was giving them hope. She was letting them know that there is something more out there, that there is a path forward, that it's not just what you see before you. This is real impact, human impact. And this was done by a five-year-old through a tin box. And so I want to leave you with that story because for me, and I, have ch I get chills every time I tell it, and it's a very personal story for me, obviously, because it's my mother. But we all know, we all have one of these stories. We all have one of these stories of someone that we know, a friend, a family member. So think about those stories when you are in a rut, when you kind of don't see a path forward, when you want to change the world and you don't know how to make that first step. Use these stories as inspiration. I wish I had more time with all of you today. Um, it's been an immense pleasure talking to you. I am very much looking forward to seeing you all during the reception. And I hope something I've said today has hit your heart, or at least hit your head visually. And I look forward to, uh, to talking to you all more um, uh, after the summit. Thank you very much.